I was asked to speak about WTO, uh, APEC, and RTAs, and I guess the whole notion about how uh, trade and multilateralism uh, and the way forward uh, would, would be like uh, in today's world. Now, uh, I have been actually thinking a lot about this this year just because of something I had to do uh, at the beginning of the year related to uh, candidacy of the Director General of the WTO. So I had time to actually reflect and think a lot uh, about this. Uh, and of course, uh, there are many people in this room uh, today who, are who I have known for a long time. Uh, if you like, we have been in this process and in this uh, battle uh, to ensure uh, that we have free and fair trade uh, regionally, multilaterally uh, for a long time. And I'm glad to see that some soldiers never die, like uh, Yamaza Yamazawa-san. As they say, what is it? Uh, old generals uh, never die, they just fade away. But in this case, he hasn't really faded away. He's still there and he's still going strong. So this should give us inspiration uh, to really continue. And, and Bob Scolle, of course, uh, and other friends in this room who uh, I think we've gone through uh, thick and thin a lot. And Alan, of course, Alan Oxley. Uh, uh, some things have changed, some things have not changed. We hope certainly what has not changed is our belief uh, in uh, uh, multilateralism in the sense that the best system uh, for trade uh, to happen uh, and for, for trade to flow uh, and for it to benefit as many countries and people in these countries is still the multilateral uh, trading system uh, with its principles of non-discrimination uh, and so on. Uh, if we still have that value, uh, plus, uh, as they always say, the oxymoron word, open regionalism, uh, if we still also believe uh, that whatever we do, uh, other, other than multilateral negotiations, regional agreements, and so on, should still hold that uh, vision, then we're in good shape. The big question comes, uh, how do we achieve it? Now, let me just uh, start by saying, what's the context that we are uh, in today? It's not a good situation. I think uh, trade is not in a good situation today. Sometimes you could say, uh, if you look at uh, all the political speeches of uh, politicians today, they really try to stay away from saying anything on trade. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, trade and liberalization and opening up uh, is no longer something that comes uh, naturally to any uh, political leader. Uh, and so this is partly because of the crisis, because of protectionism trends, uh, creeping protectionism. If you believe the uh, G20 uh, trade and investment measures transparency exercise that is done every six months, it's not showing a huge increase in protectionism that everybody feared, but it does show an increase from 1% uh, affecting uh, imports at the beginning of the crisis in 2008-2009 to 3%, okay? And what is, I so it's there's an increasing trend and what is important is that what was introduced in 2008-2009 as so-called temporary didn't become temporary, it became permanent. Uh, most of them didn't get uh, pulled uh, away uh, after so-called the crisis uh, threat uh, reduced. The other trend that's important is that we are in a multipolar world, and this is maybe one of the biggest perplexing uh, issue that we face, whether it's APEC, whether it's WTO, or whether it's in the regional agreements. That is that we, don't we no longer have a, a clear leadership role of the US or the EU we have e US and EU still as economic power, but we also have emerging countries uh, like China, India, Brazil, uh, Turkey, including Indonesia, which are now emerging economies. What is the role of emerging economies? Where they are, they are still developing countries, but they are uh, advanced uh, developing countries. Should they play a greater role? This is, I think, another big question. And the final thing uh, are, is that what we call trade in our, uh, in, in the, the old traditional, now we have called there uh, and all the things that we negotiate uh, are now uh, evolving also because of global value chain, uh, 
because of other contemporary challenges such as environment, uh, even currency issue has become discussed in the WTO, energy and food, food security and water. That's just to, to indicate to you the complexity of the situation. My final thing, I mean, this is kind of a gloomy picture so far. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, let's just be realistic and say that is really the situation we are facing. I think the other, sh the other uh, worry, uh, and this is a real worry, and this is something uh, I think APEC, uh, given its role in the past and hopefully continue to be its role in the future, is, is multilateralism in crisis. Because m a lot of the multilateral negotiations, not just in trade, you take climate change, you take uh, even in the financial sector, they're all in various levels of crisis. You know, one could ask also the question, is G20 uh, still doing its job uh, in terms of being the uh, steering committee of the world economy? So uh, there is a concern that uh, uh, our issues are can only be solved globally because it's a global issue. The best way to trade is globally, right? Uh, but uh, the multilateral institutions that need to be strong at this point of time are actually all weak at the moment. So uh, that's the situation that, that we're in. Now, uh, what, what, do we, what should we be doing? Now, let's just look at WTO, APEC, and all the RTAs that are going on. If you start with the WTO, uh, where are we in on the WTO? We have been negotiating the Doha round for now, is it 11 years? Well, you, it depends when you start. If you start with 2001, then you're already in 12 years. If you start with Hong Kong, which is the time that we, we came up with the uh, structure of the negotiations, 2005, then you're talking about eight years, right? Eight years, yeah. Uh, and at the moment, one could say that we're a little bit stuck. Uh, the progress in, uh, since 2008 has been very, very minimal. Uh, and uh, Indonesia is, by the way, also hosting the WTO ministerial meeting at the end of the year. Uh, and uh, nobody is expecting the negotiations to be completed anytime soon, the whole negotiations, I mean. What, if you read the, the last agreement by WTO ministers, which is 2008 uh, minister, uh, sorry, 2000, 11, 2011 ministerial meeting. This is uh, to quote from uh, the actual uh, MC8 mandate. It calls members to explore different negotiating approaches while respecting the principle of transparency and inclusiveness. So different negotiating approaches. It means, okay, yes, we will start continue to try to complete Doha in, in steps probably, early harvest and so on. But it does say to explore different negotiating approaches. What I want to stress is respecting the principle of transparency and inclusiveness, uh, which are, uh, I believe, part of the so-called good design APEC RTAs that we talked about for many, many years, does include those kind of principles. And RCEP, for the uh, East Asia uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, which is the ASEAN uh, plus six plus plus uh, does have the these two principles, by the way. The other statement in the MC8, advanced negotiations where progress can be achieved, including focusing on elements of Doha that allow for provisional or definitive agreements based on consensus earlier than full conclusion of the single undertaking. So in other words, we have recognized that we are not going to complete the whole thing. It used to be you can only complete the whole thing because you are give, taking and giving in different parts. Now, the small balance steps, trade facilitation, duty-free, quota-free, and aid for trade. That's the target for uh, December this year. Now, is that going to be achieved? We don't know. And is that going to be enough uh, if you don't have uh, uh if you don't know what else you're going to get in the other parts. That's, that's still, I think, remaining uh, as a, a big question. Uh, and the final thing I want to quote from the MC8 mandate, intensify efforts to look into ways that may allow members to overcome the most critical and fundamental stalemates in the areas where multilateral convergence has proven to be especially challenging. That's probably going to be the hardest one uh, of all. 
the fact that they mention explore different negotiating approaches, it's opening the door for uh, what actually is from the history of the WTO, which is GATT, was the case before the WTO existed, what they call plurilateral agreements. Yeah? Uh, and, and maybe uh, the conclusion that I wanted to take from the, the situation of the WTO is that we, to be realistic, it's, it's going to be slow and it may be very difficult to get the Doha to be completed, right? So the only thing, then, then the question arises, so does WTO become irrelevant? At the moment, the answer is still no, it's not irrelevant because the dispute settlement process is still the biggest strength of the WTO and it is still creating uh, the certainty for you to do trade. Now, will it continue to be like that? That's a big question because as trade, the way you do trade uh, changes as new issues come up. Can you catch up? Can the rules catch up? That's that's kind of the issue. But because you have lack of progress in the multilateral negotiations, what's going to happen is everything else, right? Uh, and uh, there's a new word. I don't know how new a word uh, this is, but plurilaterals come under that. Then you are in a variable geometry world. I kind of like that word because it captures everything. What does variable geometry mean? It means you can take a particular issue like services or environmental goods or information technology agreement. It's a subset uh, of the whole negotiations and not all countries at the beginning are uh, in that negotiations, but then eventually you want all countries to be there. Or you take a subset of countries who negotiate on all or a subset of the trade negotiations. That's what that's what variable geometry really means. So let me close by let's let's try to see what is this variable geometry. And because at the end of the day, variable geometry means you're doing a subset. But if you still believe in that, uh, I hope we still believe that in the in the common vision of multilateral uh, global trade is the best answer. You're doing it uh, step by step to reach that goal, right? It's Fred Bergsten's bicycle theory. You just keep on go. You want to keep on going, but you have to be clear where your end goal is, and therefore you keep on going, but with an objective that you want to reach that end goal. Can we do that? I think that's the big question, and this is where APEC. As far as I know, I have been doing APEC for a long time, and we always saw APEC as having this role of championing this road towards that objective and uh, being the cheerleader uh, towards that process. Now, can, can APEC still uh, play that role? Uh, let me just say a few things about variable geometry. Let's take whatever is trying to happen in the WTO on the plur plurilateral agreements. You have kind of basically two types of plurilateral agreements that's happened in the, in the uh, WTO to date. One is uh, the ITA-1 okay, which was actually b born, we would like to take credit for it, uh, through an APEC process in 96 in Manila, where a critical mass group of countries uh, within APEC agreed, and I b I if I'm not mistaken, that critical mass was about 90% of the trade in uh, information technology agreement. But we took that and negotiated it in APEC, but we made it MFM, not just for the countries that negotiated. That's kind of the best way, and that's kind of the MFN clause that we always try to have in the good principles of uh, regional agreements or plurilateral agreements uh, in the APEC context. The other one is the government procurement agreement, which is a subset, a plurilateral agreement, but the beneficiaries are only those who sign on to the agreement. The big question right now is the ISA, the International Services Agreement, which is trying to be a plurilateral agreement on services, uh, there are 21 uh, members of it already, including the EU uh, and the US, uh, and a number of uh, Scandinavian countries and a number of uh, uh, Latin American countries. Uh, is that going to be within the WTO or outside of the WTO? If it's within the WTO, is it going to be more like the government procurement agreement or is it going to be uh, uh, made MFN at some stage? Bear in mind again, the principle of transparency and inclusiveness. If they set a very high standard 
it's going to be very difficult for developing countries and small countries to ever be able to, to meet uh, the standards. That, that uh, defeats the purpose of the inclusiveness uh, principle. Um, uh, that's uh, within, now, going back to APEC, has APEC played a role in, uh, in the multilateral agreement? APEC was born right after Uruguay round, 89, right? It was kind of a process when the Uruguay round started. We already started talking a lot about the importance of regional, uh, regional uh, vision, regional approaches, and what should we be doing with regard to uh, multilateralism and so on. And I w we would like to think, I think, Ipe, you were there from the beginning and uh, in within the PECC work on the Trade Policy Forum. It was also born uh, because of the Uruguay round. And one would like to think that uh, in 93, when uh, the first APEC economic leaders meeting in the US, some would like to say that it that helped to push the deadlock that was happening at the time between the US and EU on agriculture. It pushed uh, for the completion. Now, we had hoped that in 2010, uh, when the US was uh, the chair of APEC, that that could also happen, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. I'm not sure in today's world we can expect uh, that kind of role for APEC, but certainly things like EGS and ITA2, which is also another thing that's being discussed, could be something that uh, APEC uh, could contribute. Uh, other than uh, WTO and prudential agreements, of course, the other big thing is all the regional bilateral agreements that are happening. And there are two huge bilateral agreements or regional agreements right now that, that really happen only, uh, really accelerated this year, uh, which are just too big to ignore, which is the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership and the other one, uh, I forget what the acronym is, but it's Trans-Atlantic Partnership, what is it, TTIP, Trans-Atlantic Partnership in trade and investment or something like that. It's between the US and the EU. Huge, all right? <laughs> uh, what do we do? And what does that mean for the WTO? What does it mean for multilateralism? What does it mean for the rest of us uh, in, in the region who also have uh, ASEAN and RCEP uh, and a, a, a number of bilaterals? At the end of the day, of course, these, uh, if, you, if we take our APEC um, view. They are too big to ignore. They, they will happen. The important thing is uh, to understand the potential effects and the appropriate response and perhaps hopefully agree on some principles. Okay, I have a list of principles that come from years of <laughs> talking about this in PEC, in APEC Study Center, uh, as well as in APEC itself. Some some of you maybe should go back and look at the, what was it called? Model principles, is that what they're called? Model principles of uh, APEC, RT, of RTAs within uh, APEC. Some of them are there. Inclusion, non-discrimination, transparency, comprehensiveness, best practices and standards, objective and scientific based standards and criteria, and I would add capacity building. Because even within the WTO, that's always how you said, okay, you have special and differential treatment, uh, you're growing at a slower rate, you have a lesser of a binding commitment, but at some point you will reach it if you get capacity building. I think that principle is still uh, very important even in the way we look at regionals and bilaterals. So if you, let's, if you look at TPP and EU and US as contrasted to what we are doing in Asia, it's a completely different approach. In Asia, what we do, if you look at what we did in ASEAN, as well as in the ASEAN plus one, and what we are doing in RCEP, it's uh, built, uh, what do you call it, evolutionary, right? You start with goods, you go to investment, then you go to services, and then you have the ASEAN economic community. Then you start adding partners, and even in adding partners, we had different models. With China, Japan, and Korea, we also did it block by block. The only one we, we went comprehensive was with Australia and New Zealand. Yeah? And even the goods coverage was different. So RCEP, the principle of RCEP is how do you consolidate all this with those principles? 
and the most important principle is actually best standards and practices. You ratchet up. So if RCEP is to work, I'll just give you one example. Uh, the coverage of goods uh, in ASEAN is actually already uh, almost 100%. But in the ASEAN plus one, the coverage with India is 80%. The coverage with Australia and New Zealand is 99%. So for if you want to consolidate the ASEAN plus one all agreements, you have to go to 99%. Okay? And India has to be prepared to go to 99%. If not, then wait. Right. That's the principle. That's to give you a concrete example of how the spirit of RCEP should happen, and that's when you say uh, uh, inclusiveness and transparency and open accession. Actually, RCEP has the principle of open accession, which is a very strong principle, by the way. I don't think uh, I would say uh, uh, I, I haven't seen it in in any other regional agreements. Normally, every other regional agreements will say you can exceed as long as you do a whole lot of other things. Um, in contrast, TPP and e UA EU and US start with very comprehensive and very high standards. Uh, and here, uh, I think the issue is inclusiveness and transparency. I don't think many of us who are not part of the TPP negotiations know what is uh, being negotiated and what kind of standards are being negotiated. And you're excluding large uh, countries like India and, and China. So if TPP, TPP on paper has this objective of being gold standard, uh, leading the way, uh, and if it actually can work, it can be uh, the the uh, the answer to Doha not being completed, it's it's actually Doha plus plus. It has all uh, it is very comprehensive, but what happens if it's only the TPP partners that are in that are part of the agreement? How do you make sure that the others are going to be included at some point, but in a way that they can be included? Uh, and that's two issues there: the very high standards, and even if you have high standards, maybe it's not just a question of high standards, but the standards that are applying to developed countries which may be very different from what uh, other countries uh, can meet. And is there a capacity building for you to be able to join? Even if you could join, is there a way for you to join uh, through capacity building uh, or whatever? The EU and US is even more complicated because as far as I know, it is less about uh, market access, it is more about uh, convergence and uh, mutual recognition of regulations and standards. And some people say this is going to be very difficult uh, for the US and EU to achieve. Uh, but then you're even talking about US and EU creating standards and regulations. Uh, what happens to the rest of us? You know, If they're not going to be transparent in the process, that's uh, what, how, what, what, what are the other countries going to do? At the end of the day, we, it's going to be ratcheted up to their standards? Uh, that's a big question out there. So. I think uh, what we need to do in APEC is, uh, uh, as my final point, uh, we need to think through this again. We are in a very challenging situation. What is the role of APEC again uh, as the champion, as the cheerleader, and maybe uh, once again, let's look back at our principles, model principles. Are they still relevant? Uh, can, can we look at it again to see how we can make it relevant uh, or even workable uh, in today's changing context. And uh, and if, if we want to take the benign view uh, or the positive view of how plurilaterals and bilaterals can get us to that big vision again of multilateralism, you have to think about how do you make bilaterals or plurilaterals or regionals uh, have a clear pathway based on principles and, and uh, probably a process that you multilater multilateralize it at the end. I mean, I still, I, I suppose I will continue to still believe that even though uh, in practice, uh, uh, in terms of whether it can be implemented, uh, I maybe, maybe realistically uh, have to be very realistic of, of whether we can really actually implement it. But I think in a forum like this where you are APEC, uh, in an APEC study center, I think you should still uh, have that belief and do your academic research and the number crunching to show maybe what would happen if you didn't do that. What's the uh, negative 
uh, side effects, if you had substandard agreements, if you had the spaghetti ball effect, if you had, if you exclude a large number of the of the small countries, the, de the developing countries who will not be able to join uh, these agreements, what's the cost? You know, I think that that may be where your uh, your advantage as uh, academic institutions that you should play a role and maybe think about the way forward uh, a little bit more. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think it's it's uh, important also to. Uh, I'm not sure what is the link between APEC and G20, uh, but uh, I was in a G20 session in the Boal Forum actually, and we had a very interesting discussion. And one of the conclusions that I thought was, was important, given that uh, G20 is a little bit like APEC, uh, you, t you, do you have peer pressure, like all these transparency measures, both in the trade side as well as in the monetary side. Uh, is peer pressure what we are doing with IAPs and CAPs? Uh, and, and the idea of G20 is similar. You have a group of leaders that, okay, let's agree on a universal value or a common goal. And uh, we agree on the goal, but it's ministers and other forum that delivers it. Yeah? For the finance one, it's very clear because you have the finance ministers, you have the IMF. On the other issues, it's not so clear. Uh, so maybe on the trade uh, channel within the G20, that maybe can be uh, strengthened. Uh, and one of the things that I thought, uh, because we always, in the last few years, being the trade minister, we always have to draft that paragraph in the G G20 statement. It's only like three or four sentences, but you have no idea how much uh, going on. And for the last few years, it has been the same. <laughs> Uh, we commit to conclude the Doha round. <laughs> I don't think we can say that again this year. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what they're going to say this year because I'm no, lo no longer involved in the process. But I wanted to have one, just one sentence in there that leaders commit uh, to the, the notion that we accept that there are all these variable geometry going on. But we want to, we, we uh, task ministers or, or whoever to come up with the principles to make sure that the variable geometry still brings us back to the bigger goal and hopefully the, the leaders still believe uh, in the bigger goal that global trade uh, and multilateralism is really the our final goal while we accept that this variable geometry will be uh, going on. That, that's actually, if we could get that uh, inside the G20 leader statement, that allows uh, the institutions like the WTO, including APEC also, to think through and deliver, hopefully, uh, uh, either a, a, an operational set of principles or really think through, uh, because actually APEC is probably the one fora that has thought a lot about this, because we've had to think a lot about what do we really mean by open regionalism. Okay, uh, I'll end on that note and hope that uh, I've hopefully inspired uh, some of you or uh, many of you to, to continue this good work. 